I'm Tony Royceman, uh, the chairman of the Public Utility Commission. You probably already know Margaret and Sarah, and uh, we are just delighted to see you all here and to, uh, to talk to us about anything except something that's pending. Um, as you know, uh, we can't discuss any of those items. Uh, you should know that before I had this job, I was the president of the Hanover Consumer Co-op. So I'm a co-op. You understand. Yes. So you know what capital credits are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a slide just on that. That's right. That's right. I know your problems. <laughs> anyway, what the, the purpose of this is for you to give us insights into things that you would like us to know about how you operate, how that interfaces with how we operate, things that we're doing that you think we could do in, in ways that would be more helpful to you, and uh, if there are any things that we're doing that you like. And also, and also may I add, oh, sorry, yeah. observ observations about things that are happening newly that we may not even be aware of that are um, actually good news or um, difficult news for you. Right. Particularly from a co-op perspective, you're, you're grouped together because you're both co-ops. Is there something in the co-op world that we should know about? Like, you found a new way to deliver broadband to, you know, it's the craze across the nation or something. You know, very, uh, I think, co-op oriented. So, with that, we probably should go around the room with introductions. Yeah, sure. I'm Tom Nauer, I'm with the PUC. I'm Rebecca Town, currently Vermont Gas and soon to be Vermont Electric. We we're glad you could join us. Yes, thank you. Yes. For inviting me. Well, we're delighted to have you. I'm Vicki Brown. I'm general counsel and interim CEO for just two more weeks till I <laughs> hand that off to Rebecca. I'm Mike Brissell, the CFO for Vermont Electric. I'm Andrea Cohn. I do government affairs and member relations for Vermont Electric. I'm Richard Rubin. I'm a board member at WEC. Patty Richards and general manager at Washington Electric. Roger Fox, Vice President of the Board, and a rare opportunity to upstage my uh, co-conspirator <laughs> here. Barry Bernstein, I live in Callis, and I'm uh, President of the Board of the And I'm Steve Knowlton. I'm also a board member of Washington Electric Co-op. Also my neighbor. Mm -hmm. So we'll go in the back. I'm Kyle landis Marinello, General Counsel at the Commission. Uh, Victor Veve, uh, Director of uh, Development for Green Lantern. And Bishop, I'm also with commission staff. We're being filmed today. Okay. I'm trying to smile. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, uh, who'd like to start? We would have watched an electric co op. Uh, just to apologize, I'm going to have to leave at about a quarter after 11 because I've got a wedding in New York City. I have to attend. Um, I just wanted to can these out, one for each of you. Okay. This is our uh, our newest co-op current. I don't know if you guys get this at home, but I get it at home. But we also get it. It's sent to the office as well. It is. Yeah. Okay. Everybody gets it. I thought I had one more, but I okay. you got one there. Steve? I, I have. I get yeah. one at home. There. I've got. It. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hand I handed that out because it, um, and it has um, both what we're doing, but it also. Um, has a dialogue between Patty and I about the co-op difference in this particular month's issue. Um, I've been a co-op member for almost five decades, as has Roger and Richie. Um, our board, we have nine people on our board. The, the uh, age range is from 35 to 75. Uh, it's a wide, everybody has to be a member, obviously, to be on the co-op board to get elected. Uh, it ranges, we have a farmer, and we have a retired a post, post office person, we have a former Senate senator and head, former head of the Senate Finance Committee, we have a, another illustrious uh, attorney down at the end of the table, we have a couple of former professors, um, we have a consultant for small businesses and, and co-ops. It's, it's a diverse group of people, we've all been pretty committed. The thing I want to just briefly mention about the co-op difference. Um, our co-op has gone through a lot of changes since the 70s, and it's been driven by our members. Um, it, after the oil embargo of 73, a number of us got involved in our co-op because 
we wanted to see the direction change. Um, we were uh, pushing for more energy efficiency and conservation in the 70s in our co-op. And uh, in the 80s, we were pushing for us to get out of nuclear power. Uh, our co-op did not go through bankruptcy as our sister co-op and our New Hampshire co-op did, but we were instrumental in getting the uh, lawsuit uh, to go to the Supreme Court, which they had validated the co-op contract, municipal and co-op contracts through MWEC um, in order, because they said boards could not identify, could not uh, cause future boards to enter into black hole contracts. In 1990, when the majority of the board changed, um, we were uh, instrumental in starting the first energy efficiency and conservation program in the United States, working with the people, Blair Hamilton, Bess Sachs, uh, including fuel switching off of electric heat, because many of our members had that. It was sold as too cheap to a meter. In 2000, we got out of Yankee. We were the first and only electric utility in the, in the state to actually call for the uh, shutdown of Yankee, not a renewable <coughs> contract. Um, we built the Coventry landfill to electric, uh, methane to electric plant because we wanted our portfolio, portfolio not only be reliable and economic and close to home, but we wanted to end up with a renewable portfolio. We were the first utility in the state, and I think possibly one of the first in the country, unless they were getting hydropower out west, to be 100% renewable. We've been committed to trying to lower our carbon footprint for almost three decades. So a lot of the goals that have been uh, um, passed in legislation through the legislature, we were already there, and that's why we do have exemptions in some things. And we think it's important as a democratically controlled co-op for you to recognize that we are different. We've been a leader, we've been a yardstick in uh, measuring against both Green Mountain Power and CB, uh, Central Vermont Public Service, over decades. Um, even though the IOU in the state has come more to the consumer concentric model than they were before, they're still a profit uh, motivated utility. We return our profits, Tony, as you know, back to our members, and we've given $6.7 million back to our members in capital credit returns. We started that program in 1998. We hold public meetings, not only our annual meeting, but community meetings. We had a meeting on Wednesday night um, to talk about our potential rate uh, design, uh, redesign, um, to get members input. It's not something we're required to do because if it comes before you, you'll have your public hearings, but it me makes a difference for us to communicate and hear from our members. Our board are our members. We all have to, we have both high users and low users. We have to be thinking about what's the best for our membership. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Patty, but that's, uh, that co-op difference means a lot to us. Many of us on the board have dedicated decades to being involved in our co-op. Uh, I was involved in the beginning of the Hunger Mountain, of the, the food co-op movement in the state, actually was Plainfield at the time, as many of us have been. So we're very committed to the co-op way and the co-op difference. And I think you as regulators uh, hopefully can understand that and realize one, one decision doesn't fit all people. So. I'll turn it over to Patty and before you do that, yeah, sure. let me ask you a couple of questions. Sure, because this experience with the food co-op in Hanover, mm -hmm. uh, one of the issues that was frustrating to me was it's a that's a twenty thousand member co-op mm -hmm. in a highly contested election, which was at the time when I got elected, they mm -hmm. had an employment problem that was very disturbing. Mm -hmm. Two thousand people voted. That was the highest total of participation they've ever had. They have various rules about you have to go to the members. I think if they want to make an investment over a certain dollar number, they have to have member approval to do that. Participation rates very, very low. How are your participation rates? What, what percentage of your members 
are actively involved, like when you get elected to the board, what percentage are you seeing voting in those elections? Okay, first of all, we have about 11,000 member owners. Um, in the last few elections, it's gone from 8 or 9 percent to uh, 10 percent of our membership. Let me just point out this, that in the heyday when there was, when we wanted to change the direction of the co-op, we had, because we were raising issues that were important, we had a third of our membership voting in a number of elections. And we were able, starting in 1985, and I, again, re re reiterate, some of us got involved in 1974. In fact, one of our board, former board presidents who was part of our group, Bob O'Brien, was one of the uh, uh, first, he helped get the Hanover Co-op started when they, when they first began. Um, when people feel that we're not doing the right thing, they will show up. They have showed up, they will show up. I can't tell you how many personal conversations I have in our food co-op and I'm a member of three co-ops, but Hunger Mountain Plainfield, where people will stop and say, I've read your co-op currents, we have a good readership. People know we're there. I have people, during storms, I have people calling me at 12 o'clock at night, and I always say, that's what I'm here for. You know, uh, luckily I, I don't go to bed late, but um, till, t too early, I mean. But um, so, yes, we'd always like to have more presentations. When we've had our community meetings, we'll have 100, 100 150 people show up at a community dinner. That's a lot during a busy time. And, and what sort of your activities that relate to us do the members have to get directly involved in? For instance, if you want to add uh, a, a resource to your energy generation or you want to implement a new energy efficiency program or develop some renewable resource that you don't have developed, are those the kinds of questions that go to the membership or are they left in the hands of the board and, and your Well, some executive. of them are in, left in the hands of the board, but Patty will address yeah. that. We do, have, we do have a requirement for longer term contracts or investments. Okay. And I just will say with the Coventry, which was when we brought that to, to the Public Utility Commission, we also did ex extensive work with our membership in order to get support for that. But at that point, we were actually bringing in a proposal to build a plant that was actually higher than the market because at that point in 2003 the market was around three cents a kilowatt hour. We were we were projecting four and a half cents a kilowatt hour. It's above market, but our members supported us having renewable energy, stable long-term energy. We weren't looking for the buck. We were looking to make sure we had a long-term future, and I we're driven as you know by just different motives. So I, I feel that when People want to. They're they're there. Patty, you can Thank you. address that too further. I hope we can have this as a conversation versus just you know. I, I don't want to do the next hour talking to the whole hour. Yeah. Well, we want to make sure. Well, see, it's a chance too. <laughs> Mickey won't let us. We do. I have an alarm. Yeah. Patty, we so want them to be a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So Barry's covered a lot of ground. Um, obviously, Tony, you raised a really big question about kind of that touch of membership and how much do they get involved in things. The big decisions we have to vote on. Sheffield Wind Contract, we had a very robust turnout for the Sheffield Wind Contract. Controversial issue. Uh, the Coventry plant, I don't know what the percentage was back then, but uh, more people were voting back then because it's a big decision to make. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, Tier 3 programs. They, the membership is like Tier 3, what is that? Mm -hmm. They looked at this for the nine members to set the stage and direction of WAC. And really, it's the default to the, the nine-member board of directors to set policy in where we're going to go. Um, one of the things that we differentiated ourselves with Tier 3 this year, or this past year, was on um, weatherization. I think we're the only utility that said that's our bedrock in terms of the Tier 3 program. And I want to personally thank you all for supporting um, our claim for savings through the capstone program. Um, that's, to, to me, the Tier 3 program really needs to rest with weatherization and you know, as we get through the murkiness of the renewable energy standard and kind of come out the other side in a few years and get more efficient at it, it's important that we had the commission's support in, in that ruling. So I just want to personally thank you for that order that you sent out about a month ago. Um, 
Barry touched on the cooperative process in that the difference with a cooperative is, and there's two big differences. One is not only we're not-for-profit, but to the extent, and this differentiates us from the municipals, is that if we do over-collect in any given year, we give all that money back. So we, there's a process with capital credits. It's an allocation process and then a retirement. And I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but the, the essence of us making a financial mistake, so to speak, and over-collecting, means the membership gets their money back in bigger capital credits. So there's no mistake, so to speak. It get, it's a self-correcting mechanism. But um, IOUs obviously don't have that model. And the municipals are not for profit, but they don't give the money back um, in the year that it's over earned. It's set for use for a later date. So the cooperative difference in that structure leads us to ask you as the Public Utility Commission to look at us as a little bit differently. Um, you know, as Barry said, the board sets the policy, they set the stage of what we do, they set the direction of what we do. To the extent they're out of touch with the membership, they're going to get voted off the board. I mean, that's the essence of kind of the um, coordination with our membership and the, and the cooperative. As, a, as an entity and as a utility, if the members really hate what we're doing, they are going to come out and vote and they're going to change the seats on the board. and. They'll all change and they'll fire me and have a whole different group. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's, it's, this is a democratic process. And when you set regulation and make decisions as part of WAC, we want you to keep that in mind because that differentiates us kind of from the other utility models we have in the state. Um, and again, everybody, you guys chime in um, if I'm missing anything. So I don't want to, I don't want to be a one person talking show here. So I think that's kind of, in terms of the co-op uh, organizational structure, that we really want to plant that seed. And I also want to just touch a little bit about, you know, if you look across the nation in terms of the U.S. in terms of how electricity is delivered, we've had many different models between big companies running the show, um, retail choice spinning off, and you have many aggregation services coming into play. I look at WAC and the co-op model, I'm not speaking for VEC, but looking at WAC as we're essentially like an aggregator. And I look at us as, you know, we've, if, if people don't like the choices that we're making as a utility, they have a voice. You know, yes, we're still the monopoly utility, but they have the voice to come in and speak to the board of directors. They can come into any of our uh, monthly meetings. Ultimately, people can rally and um, campaign to get on the board and change and direct policy and philosophy. But essentially, I look at it as the, the membership really has a voice in what we do. So to the extent that we're steering the ship wrong, and we're going the wrong direction, we're going to hear that from members. We certainly, they're, they're very vocal at annual meetings. Um, we have people writing in to us. They tell us when we're off base. In our, our newsletter, it sounds a little hokey that we're talking about a newsletter, but the surveys that we have put out, we have 75% readership of that newsletter. It's amazing what people read in the newsletter. I'll get calls and they'll ask me questions about something really uh, you know, deep in the newsletter in our SWORP report. I'm like, oh my god, someone's actually reading that? <laughs> um, it's, it's a great communication piece. And one of the things that we're committed to is communicating to the membership. Um, and I, there's a lot of, we're trying to be completely transparent about everything that we do and get that message out um, to the community, the communities we serve. And it's been a very effective tool for us. So I'll say something, Tony. I'll breathe. <laughs> I think it's <clears throat> your guys' responsibility to keep us healthy and the munis and Burlington. We used to have CV and Green Mountain Power, I think as some of you may know, CV and Proctor Marble elected Republican governors. They get together to decide who'd be the governor, and that went on for 40 years. Um, they control the political process and energy distribution in many other ways. <coughs> now we have Green Mountain Power running the whole thing. We have a soft and fuzzy Green Mountain Power. But Mary Powell will not always be there. Uh, the profit motive will always drive the decisions of Green Mountain Power. The political desire to control the political conversation in the state will be there. And we, us, and the munis provide a counterweight to that. 
Do we provide a, uh, a new outlook, a not-for-profit outlook, um, a long-term outlook? And um, we're innovative and creative and democratic. In many parts of the country, we have public power. You know, out west, we don't have that here. So as you make decisions, we should be, it should be really paramount that co-ops have to be healthy and supported by this board. And um, there are a number of ways to do that in terms of re reducing the regulatory burdens on us or being really more sensitive, I think, to the effect of uh, the transfer of cost in net metering programs um, and how that drives our rates. <clears throat> so I just want to make a philosophical point about who we are, but what we do for the state as a whole. You know, we don't try to elect governors and have uh, big lobbying organizations that drive conversation in broad economic and taxation issues in the state. Um, and so that's what I have to say about that. I, was, I had a very basic question about WEC. Uh, you have nine board members. How many employees are there? 37. <coughs> and of those, 27 are technical out in the field. There's 10 of us responding to workshops. <laughs> <laughs> There's one of us that responds a lot. <laughs> um, we're, we're pretty light in terms of staff. Yeah, but it doesn't mean we don't have a, obviously we have a voice, uh, we show up and participate. Hopefully things we say are useful. <laughs> Um, one of the things I do want to applaud is the EPUC setup. That's really allowed a whole bunch of efficiency streamlining and no and more stacks, piles, piles and piles of paper. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I want to yeah. give credit where credit is due. A lot of credit goes to Anne Fisher. Yeah. Yes. Because she has yes. spearheaded this effort. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we had a team working on it. Yeah. 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 It works well. Still <laughs> the process. And Patty, do you find you have to uh, count on mutual aid a lot because of the 27, you know, that you have, you don't have that many people in the field So if there's a storm? Big storms, yes. Yeah. But the problem is when it's a big storm, everybody, everybody needs their own staff. So it's, it, right. I mean, if we could magically make mutual aid appear during these widespread mm -hmm. storms, and obviously <coughs> the storm, uh, the 100 year storm is instead of having it once every 10 years, you know, it's really a probability event. It doesn't mean we're gonna have one in 100 years, it's a percentage probability. But we're having these high, these low probability events happen more and more often. And just in the last, you know, in the, I think about the, you know, the, this, the week long outage restoration process and staying at the office for a week, um, you know, the, there's several events that we've had in my few, five years at Washington Electric Co-op and reliability is really, paramount to all the members. First and foremost, if you ask any of the members, any customer in the state actually, what's the most significant thing that you want from your electricity? Then they'll say, keep it on, reliability. So the storm issue has been, it has been a, an issue for us. Our response to that is increasing right away clearing. And one of the things that we're filing in our rate increases is more money in the right away budget. So okay. We won't talk about that for this. Okay. <laughs> I do have one other question, which is, yeah. um, do you w worry, and I'm going to ask the co-op too, uh, cyber. How much time do you spend worrying about yeah. cyber attacks? So, <laughs> We had Neil with the great non-cyber yeah. attack. <laughs> <laughs> we need to go into executive session. <laughs> so the beautiful thing about WEC is, because we're a little bit low tech, is we're not a threat. Or we're not perceived as... Uh, a high, high value target for those that are doing bad things. Or to, you know, the, threat, the threat risk to us is more of somebody financially trying to you know, send in, hey, uh, Patty Richards is sending a note to the CFO to withdraw a million dollars out of our bank account. We have that risk. There, there's no doubt that that risk is in play. Um, we, we have our checks and balances internally on the finances, <coughs> and we talk about that quite a bit. Every audit cycle, financial audit cycle, we, we talk about that issue. Um, internally, but in terms of the actual reliability aspect, our SCADA system is not hard, hardwired. We can't control from the office to our substations. So we can monitor, but we can't control. So the target for us, even if somebody broke in, they can't do anything, because that feature is turned off. 
So, and you know, because we're so far downstream um, on the system, think about we go from from Velco to GMP to WEC to get up through there to use us as a conduit to build up through is very difficult. And then because of our SCADA system is not accessible by computer to go upstream, there's we're just not. Not right. physically a potential threat. Could somebody try? Certainly. Um, but our, our real risk profile is somebody hacking in via malware, trying to steal money from banks, maybe try to get customer data. Thank you. That said, we have an IT person that's very much in his bailiwick <coughs> view to, to monitor all that stuff. Just say also our National Rural Electric Co op Association, which is about a thousand co ops. I'm on the national board is spending a lot of time and effort to be supportive to the local co-ops and cyber attacks. So one of the things that we did want to just kind of plant the seed on in terms of regulation, we want to make an ask of, of you, in addition to us being a show and tell, and I think we've got some you know, handouts to give you kind of who WAC is and I'm not going to go through all that, but it'll you can just page through and take a look at what WAC is. But we also want to make an ask, and one of our asks, and this relates to the rate regulation workshops that we had about a year ago. Again, understanding the co-op model in terms of who we are, and the process of going through for rate recovery, there was some discussion uh, relative to rate regulation: is could we do it different for the not-for-profits? And I'm speaking on behalf of WAC and not the whole not-for-profit world. But the process of known and measurable for a co-op is, I'm questioning whether that really makes sense. And there may be a better method to use rather than the known and measurable model. And I'd like to propose and have you think about, instead of us using that metric or that structure for rate, you know, we file for rate increase and, and rate did, um, rate changes, we look at a budget process versus creating this known and measurable effect. And the, the beauty of a budget is this is what the board of directors votes on. They vote on a budget every year, and to the extent we match what the board of directors votes on in terms of what we're going to do for the next year, our plan for the next year, versus going in and filing for a rate change that's based on a known and measurable, it's, it separates this board from what we're actually filing and recovering in rates. And there's always a differential, and what happens is we cover we recover less than what our budget says. And we're always squirming each year to kind of make up for what we had planned to do relative to budget <coughs> and then what we have in our rate base. We're always behind the scenes, and we're always playing catch up. So I just want to plant a seed that the co-op, not the not-for-profit model, acts a little differently, and we did speak about this way back when we were doing those workshops, but um, kind of a, a takeaway from the workshops, an action plan, you know, I'd like to have us think about that in terms of the regulatory paradigm. You know, could we change that? It would make us a whole lot more efficient in what we do internally. Um, you know, we can sync up our, our rate structure with a budget structure cycle every year versus decoupling the two. You might have a budget that's a calendar year, but then a rate year can be, you know, from, you know, from you know, July to July kind of thing. So it would sync those two up. It's, there's a lot of, there'd be a lot of synergies and value add if we could do that a little differently. I'm going to pause and see if there's questions on that. Well, I, it, let me let me just kind of make sure I understand. Are you saying your budget is like your roadmap and that that is what drives everything you do as opposed to um, you know, known and measurable, I guess. I don't know. You're comparing the two, so I'm, I'm trying so to we have compare a plan, that. Right, so let's say we have a plan to clear a whole lot more trees next year. Mm -hmm. I have to look at a last year, a test year, an actual year of costs that are at least a year separate. There's usually a mm -hmm. six months in. So we're looking at a prior year's expenditures, and then i got to defend everything that I changed a whole lot of time justifying why I wanted to spend more money on right-of-way when my average of the last five years is less. 
and I have to fight for this every time. But I want to clear more trees so we have less outages. Just it's there's a break in between kind of what we're what we'd like to do in terms of the money we collect in terms of budget, and then what we're getting the process of what we're getting recovery and raise. There's a disconnect between the two. Can, can, if I understand what you're suggesting is that because the budget goes through a process, you have to get your yes. board approval and then you have to come up with a plan that the board has to say, yes, that meets what we want. Yes. That that is a substitute for the known and measurable process so that to the extent that we want to know how much is really needed for next year, instead of asking as we would to the GMP to give us a projection based upon last year, show us why it's higher or lower, what you're saying is our budget process is an internal check and we'd like you to rely on that rather than make us go through the known and measurable. Is that basically it? Essentially. And again, our, our budget sets up the plan for the next year of how we spend our money. How we allocate that? Well, the budget. Do you? Do you? I, I should know. I'm not from West Limburg, but um, do you have members vote on the budget, or is it just the board? It's votes? the board of directors, and that's the, the membership <laughs> looks to the board to manage that and direct that. It's the membership. I'm just sure. Oh thank goodness! <laughs> I'm just like, oh my god! Like, <laughs> I never pass a budget. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, but I we, understand. we build that budget based on known and measurable, but we take into account what's going to be the reality for the year that we're going to be operating the budget. So. And it, sorry. So you, you mentioned that efficiency is one of the um, things that goes by the wayside through this process. Is it also your ability to be innovative and plan? Um, for example, that I need to clear more trees because of the trends that I'm seeing, but I can't because last year is tying my hands as to the number that I can put forth. Right, so we'll have a budget and our board will say, go forth and trim $850,000 worth of trees. In rates, we're only recovering Let's say eight hundred thousand. So does so that ties your hand in terms of planning? At the oh. end of the year, we scramble to say where, you know, where's all our money coming from. So we recover less than what our budget lays out. So mm -hmm. we're always in this squishy, kind of this gray area. Because of the co-op model, we have we have nine members on the board monitoring what we do, and they answer to the membership directly in terms of the rates. So I feel that the accountability rests, you know, it's not like you have this not-for-profit that's running wildly, setting out budgets that are you know, crazy high. These guys have to account for the rates in terms of the budget they pass. And there's no cakewalk in for these guys, <laughs> I'll assure you. Um, and the other check and balance to this is in the event we over-collect and we don't spend the money, then it goes back to the consumer. It goes back to the membership at the end of the year. So we have, if we need to collect $14 million in terms of running the business, and these guys pass the budget for $15 million, we have a million dollars left over at the end of the year, it goes back to the membership. So there's a really good check and balance uh, in the system and the structure we have as set up as a co-op that, to me, the budget process is a workable mechanism because of the model we have. You could try it for three years or something. That's <laughs> true. Well, have you ever done an alternative regulation plan? I don't think as So well. the alternative regulation plan doesn't fit a not-for-profit so because, because it's carrots and blocks. sticks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you, you would give us an incentive to come under on certain budget items. Mm -hmm. So you, I don't know what incentive you'd give us. <laughs> In the, in the investor-owned utility, you increase the rate of return. And then the stick is if you overspent in that area, then you decrease the rate of return. You don't have a rate of return. It sounds like Vicki's agreeing with that. Yeah, I agree, yeah. It's, it just doesn't fit. And that's where the budget model, to me, makes the most sense because that's what these guys say, go forth and go, <coughs> plan, build, um, you know, manage your system manage the power supply por portfolio based on $14 million, and it's our charge to go do that. 
Can I just respond to this? Because yes, we, oh, have oh, closely, yes, you get to talk we have closely about. aligned our budget process with our rate process. Every year when we're doing our budget, we're looking at a test year that just is a six-month lag from actual. We're looking at the year before, and then we're looking at the next year. And so we're doing all that. Every year we come in with the idea, okay, what's our budget going to be? What rates do we need to support this budget? Fortunately, we've been able to stay out for the last four years. And I think our average rate increase for the past, what, nine? Nine less years. Than, less than one percent. Less than one percent. But that's the pr approach we took several years ago, and it's worked really well for us. But there's still a disconnect between the rate year and the actual financial fiscal year you're in. Between the test year? Yes. And the, the test and year, the sorry. Yeah, you're right. I don't know. We have not ha had a problem with that. I mean, we're. It's, yeah, it's I, I don't fine. think this is an issue for us. But it's, it, it's fine if you're not in a rate pressure scenario. Whereas we're in a rate pressure scenario every year because of transmission costs, capacity costs. You've been able to do some creative things on your end on the power supply mm -hmm. side, um, and we just don't. We don't have those rabbits in our in our hat to pull out. So we're in a continual cycle of pressure, rate pressure. And when you're in that, we, that's when the disconnect between the the test year and the future year becomes an issue. I don't think we have rabbits that we pull out of our hat. I, I think it's <laughs> I just a different, it's it's a a different strategy. Term. And um, you know, it, that's an issue for, for WEC. I don't think we have the same issue. If I understand what, what the message, at least, that I'm hearing from all of you, uh, from the WEC side, at least, mm -hmm. and then we want to hear from the BEC side, is in a typical utility, there are two parties of interest. There are shareholders and there are rate payers. Mm -hmm. And in order to make sure that the rate payers get a fair shake, the department and then ultimately the PUC protects against the shareholders who legitimately say, we want to make more money. We, we, we invested, we want to get more back. And what I hear you saying is that in the co-op model, the ratepayer and the shareholder are the same. Exactly. And uh, therefore, there isn't the same need to have an outside interest come in and protect that ratepayer. The ratepayer is in charge uh, exactly. to the extent, and that's why I was asking you questions about member participation and so forth. So if you suddenly came into us and said, well, we want to double our rates this year, you'd have to figure out, what's my membership going to say if we wanted to double our rates? If GMP were to do that, the shareholders would say, wow, that's great. <laughs> and then it would have to be, you know, the PUC and the department exactly. stepping in to say, oh, no, you can't, you, you can't go that far. So you're asking us to take that into account when we are regulating the rates. Is that a fair? That's well said. Okay. So our yeah. alt reg the structure we're using a budget would make more sense than doing the classic GMP all reg. Okay. All right. Just an example, we went 11 years without any rate increase. We then got hit with the rec market going down. We rely on rec revenue. Uh, and we have ended up with a 19 point some percent increase. Our members came back and said, we really would appreciate if you could do smaller, more frequent rate increases rather than something all at once. We didn't have a choice then because it just, everything dropped, but that's the message we try to try to do when we're, we're, we're but we did get feedback and we responded to it. I think yeah. you captured that very well. Um, I used to represent investor-owned utilities, and it's a fine utility model uh, for years, but I saw management struggle with that, you know, who, who are our loyalties to, the shareholders or our rate payers? And since I joined the co-op, it's been clear, I mean, our constituents are the same as yours. We're all looking forward, uh, out for the, the rate payer, and there's nobody who hates a rate increase more than our CFO here. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's very hard to, our budget process is brutal. If you're coming in and asking for something that is higher than you have now, you're going to have to justify that. It has upward pressure on rates because there are so many external upward pressure on rates in the form of net metering costs, uh, transmission costs, what am I missing, power costs. 
you know, those things are not always within our control. So where we can control costs, we're expected to control costs. I did have a presentation, and I was going to walk through it, but I think we'll just riff on some of the stuff that WEC, WEC has said. Can I add one more thing? Okay. I got three minutes. Can I take three more minutes? Sure. On net metering, just want to chime in on net metering. Um, WEC is in full support of the net metering structure. Our, we think that metering is a great thing to do. So we still think the rates are too high. And we applaud the PC for bringing the adders down a little bit. But we th in order to make net metering continue in a successful way, if we can get the rates that are paid more aligned with the value that the utility is receiving in terms of reduced power supply expense, then we will avoid this cost shift issue. And our big concern is shifting costs from one group that wants to net meter to other consumers that either are can't afford to pay their bill, you know, like a grandma do, grandma down the street. I don't want her to be having higher bills as a, as a result of paying for the expensive power that could have been done cheaper and could still be solar and done cheaper. I still think we have a rate uh, realignment that needs to happen on net metering. Um, WEC is up to uh, just under, or just over four megawatts. This is a 16 megawatt utility. We're at 25 percent of our peak with pending, with installed and pending systems uh, in terms of CPGs in line. The, the numbers are big. What, what do you when you say we're at 25, we're at 26. We're 26. Yes. And Sorry, when you can... say that, are you just plain net metering, no bigger projects? It's it's just net metering. metering. So 16 megawatt utility, four megawatts of net metered solar. Yes. Yeah. We're what, at, what, what, we're 26. 26%. And, and the, the large net metering projects are the ones that take up the vast majority of that capacity. Our statistics is over 60% of that 26% is large 500 kW projects. Can you say that one more time, Vicki? 60%. 60 we'll give you that slide. And that's that's too. 10 members that participate in those large projects. Is that it? It's in the slide Yeah, it's in here, yeah. yeah. Oh, and WEX data is in the slide packet as well. Oh, oh, I'm going right. to show yeah. off and transfer over to you. Do you want to just give them the slide? Sure. Yes, that's good. Thank you. What did they used to do before there were slides? Do <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you want me to give us a staff? Yeah, right. Uh, yes, could I just give it to staff first? Oh, oh, sure. Do we have a, if I have a question? <clears throat> Mimeograph? Uh, is there an extra for... With that nice aroma. Here you go. Yeah. I just want to make sure they have it. <laughs> Richard and I, we go back far enough. Not quite quill and you know, <laughs> oh, five copy carbon. Right, yes. I think these guys covered a lot of ground here in terms of understanding the value that a co-op brings to, to the state and to the energy um, industry. Um, uh, what I'd like you to understand is, you know, we've been serving rural Amer rural Vermont for 80 years now. We had our 80th anniversary this past May. And I think there's an impression of co-ops as being stodgy and old-fashioned and kind of out of it. And I'd like to dispel that. We have been really successful in hiring talented staff. We are an employer of choice in Lamoille County. We pay well. We give good benefits. We're a union shop, and that kind of drives that. Um, but we, as a result, we've been able to attract really good employees, including a very talented CEO. Um, we have a great management team. We were lucky enough to get Andrew a couple of years ago. And um, I think in doing that, we're able to look at things creatively, innovatively. We are really dependent on technology. Unlike WEP, we are fully automated, so we do have cyber concerns. that We pay close attention to those. We have a whole team looking at cyber and what we're finding is our biggest uh, weakness is the human beings of course so we're doing a lot of cyber <laughs> testing and yeah. they use the ceo's identity to oh it actually was when i was doing hr they sent around an attachment saying pay attention there's a new policy on social media that you have to read from our general counsel so of course everybody clicked on that to find out you know who got in trouble suspicion <laughs> 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 yeah um, so yeah we do cyber tests so, so there's a lot we do uh, exercises with homeland security and with DOE we do spend a lot of time on cyber security and, and how big is your organization how many employees? 107 employees and and how many of those are field people as opposed to in-house what do we have 75 in the field 
I would yeah, say 75. Yeah, it depends what you call field, but there's about 75 union members, and most of them work in some fashion in the right. field. Right. And how many members? We have um, about 40,000 40, readers and about 34,000 members. So we have some folks in like multiple locations. What I, what I think, too, makes, makes our um, co-op interesting is that when you compare us, even on a national basis, about half of our sole KWH are commercial accounts, which is unusual for, for a co-op. I think WEC is close to 96% residential. We're about half. So we, get, um, we have a lot of involvement with commercial businesses. They're very important to us. Um, we have some challenges with you know, being rural. We have about 14 customers per mile. In a lot of our businesses, we hear from frequently that rates is extremely important to maintaining their jobs here in Vermont. Um, and our rate design is uh, very competitive on the industrial front. We have the second lowest rates. I mean, GMP has global foundries, so you can imagine that they're able to uh, offer a very attractive rate. But we're second, so we have some very large commercial accounts. Um, one of, let me just interrupt for a minute. One of their, one of our commercial industrial customers' biggest challenges with the efficiency charge yes, because that's a huge number mm -hmm. on their bill. Yeah. And we have worked with people, uh, customers who would like to be part of a self-managed efficiency group of companies. So that's something we will be yeah. exploring with some of our yeah. larger customers. This, this particular organization spends six hundred thousand dollars a year on the. Efficiency charge. We send about five million a year to the efficiency charge from our whole co-op, and right, the the larger commercial folks are very active in the legislation, and are looking forward. You know, everything's evolving, right? We're we got the low hanging fruit with a lot of the initial efficiency work, so we're really looking for. Excuse me, I have to yeah. leave to yeah. make Thank a wedding. You. Have a good wedding. I'm I'm fine. But I'm yeah. coming. And related to the efficiency charge, that's in here as one of our challenges. And Patty had an ask. One of the things that we're looking to do is to get some support to um, change our partnership with Efficiency Vermont so that we can move their mission to help us, um, especially given the load constraints in the Shi'i, where we really, really need some load, to help us with beneficial electrification, to see if we can change um, fossil uses to electric use, use that clean electric supply that we have to reduce carbon. And I think Efficiency Vermont has a lot of resources, they have a lot of talented people, they have connections within supply chains that could help us, and we've been talking to them about expanding our partnership and expanding their role. It may take some legislative or regulatory changes, which I know you're looking at in the generic proceeding, so that's something we're, we're quite excited about. So, Vicki, would that be outside of what their appointment is? Or yeah, possibly. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, but, but we might need some within their budget, though. Okay. You know, we, we started saying we're not interested in trying to collect more money, but oh. rather shifting and you know, evolving. You know, okay. we really have a mission accomplished on a lot of the efficiency work. It's been wonderful. But now we got to think about carbon efficiency and reducing carbon. So uh, they're very excited about continuing those conversations, and so are we. And I think our members would appreciate keeping that charge flat going forward, using it in other ways. What else did I jot down? Do you want to talk about some of our demographics? We just finished a member survey that had some surprising, or maybe sure. not so surprising yeah, results. And, and also we want to mention community solar, I okay. think, if we can. But demographics, we, we have a pretty old and aging demographic. Uh, I think close to 50% of those surveyed don't kind of work regular full-time jobs, 41% are on fixed incomes, the other ones are underemployed or unemployed. Um, so it's pretty, you know, it speaks to us pretty strongly about um, keeping those rates as, as steady as we can. So just to understand, we're very motivated by that because of who our members are. Our towns, I think eight of the top uh, poorest towns, lowest income towns in the state are in our service territory. Um, you know, most of the three out of the five counties with the highest property in our so pretty low income, pretty fixed income, uh, very sensitive to that issue. So every program we do, we're always thinking about not cost shifting. 
that really motivated a lot of our net metering positions. You know, if um, we're going to end up shift, shifting costs to members who are at least in the position, you know, at least able to afford increases, you know, we're going to step up and say, let's figure out another way how to do that. And we have actually on solar, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of our community solar program, we have a little handout on that. Um, we know that we want to bring cost effective local renewable energy into our system. And we were able to do this in a way that was very market based, uh, you know, very competitive market based rates. We have three projects, five, you, you know, because you approved them, uh, five megawatts in Grand Isle, one megawatt in Heinsberg, and one in Albert. Um, and this community solar program, we're so proud of because we're bringing cost effective renewable energy. Um, folks who maybe can't, um, don't have a good location, uh, the roof is not suitable, or frankly just don't want to commit uh, to a long term uh, hosting renewable energy on their site can sponsor um, panels. And, um, you know, we're, we're really proud of it. It's a really great way to bring. So, I'm sorry, so they could sponsor a panel? Like, yeah. Kind of like your name on the brick in the walk? Yeah, I mean, they don't actually get a specific <laughs> panel. People are like, where's my panel? I'm like, no, you don't get it. Uh, but we have capacity. Say in the, the Alberg, we have 3,996 panels. And you, um, and we, we have a whole uh, tariff that you approved as well, rate structure. So, you know, costs $100, you know, uh, for a panel. And what happens is you pay or you finance, you don't have to come up with the cash, but kind of like um, a, a vegetable CSA, you gotta pay up front and then you get vegetables all season. You pay up front and then you get uh, bill credits. And it could be um, over 10 years or 20 years, depending on how many panels and what deal you want. And, and the beautiful thing about this program is you can leave any time and you get a prorated share back of, of your payment. So, And there's you, no subsidy by the other members. No, so right, no subsidy, subsidy, no cost shift. Uh, and if you're a renter, you can do this. And you don't have to, you know, if you move, you get your, your share back. You know, So it's a really nice, you know, very co-op way to bring uh, local renewable cost-effective energy into the system. So. What's the participation in this? We have sponsored almost all of Alberg, so that's almost 4,000 panels. Um, how many members? Under 200, maybe? Just under 200 members, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Let me ask you both a question, because this is something that it eats at me. Ultimately, we have to pass on disconnects of people who have medical letters. But we know there are also lots of disconnects that go on. If there's not a medical letter involved, we don't even get involved in it. What policies do each of you have regarding uh, disconnecting, given that the person you're disconnecting is obviously a member of your organization, not just a customer? How do, but what do you do, BC? Yeah, I mean, we, we follow the, the state rule. I mean, there's a very specific rule related to disconnects, and we follow it to the letter. It's heartbreaking. I mean, we yeah, hear, we, we sit with our member services people all day, and they're hearing really sad stories. It's very, it's very difficult. Yeah. And we haven't had the ability to create a low income program because, again, there's so many low income. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what do you, I mean, as you know, the state has a variety of programs which are always running out of money right. um, and obviously we know who to talk to about that but we can't get them to listen um, so what do you have to help when you see the dis I mean you you see the bill and you realize this person's in trouble they missed a hundred dollar payment last month now they're 259 right. pretty soon it's right. 500 right. do you have an outreach program to help guide either help them figure out that they're wasting energy and therefore spending money they shouldn't have to spend at all, or that they're failing to go and get help from somebody either. Anything like that, or are they pretty it's much very, on It's very own? custom, very, you know, all day our member service team is on the phone with folks, and our meter techs are in the field talking to folks because they go to do the discount. Um, by the time we're in that situation, we're a few months behind, right? Because you, you don't get billed till after you use the energy. Right. And then you got so many days, so we're already two or three months you know, behind. Um, we work out payment arrangements. Uh, we send folks, depending on where they live, to local. We know, we know who can help locally. 
Um, we heard will, churches who will help out. We know right. the churches that have funds available. So we have lists of what, you know, depending on where people live, where we might be able to direct them. Um, and we will send them to Efficiency Vermont frequently. You know, we'll be like, because we have the um, smart, smart hubs, we can see hourly usage. So we'll talk to them on the phone and be like, what were you doing last week? <laughs> you know, we can look and say, well, and sometimes it's like, oh, my family was visiting. Okay, well, that's why. You know, you, you, we can really dissect kind of what's going on with them. Sometimes we'll find there's a, heat, uh, there's a pump running, you know, that they don't even know that's broken. And it's just, so we can help them, you know. One but, thing that would help is we, because we have the smart meters, we have the ability to remotely disconnect. But there is a regulatory requirement that we do a phys physical visit you know, usually we're leaving a door hanger and not talking to people. And so what has happened is some people have come to rely on that, so they won't pay. They'll they'll write the check when the person shows up to disconnect them, and then they're hit with a uh, you know disconnect fee and a reconnect fee, or they vi barely avoid the reconnect fee. So it's it, it has created some perverse incentives on the part of our yeah. our customers. Yeah. What about WEC? What do you guys so, do? So at WEC we. Um, first thing we try to do is get them on a budget plan. So 12-year cycle, let's get you set up to manage the funds um, or manage your usage and your whatever you've accrued in a bill. So budget plan is really big. And then if they're receptive to having somebody come out and take a look at what they're using, we try to do as much diagnosis on the phone, just as you folks, as, as the EC does, try to do as much diagnosis on the phone. But we'll send out Bill Powell, we'll do home energy audits, and the, for those that are receptive to having somebody come out in their home, not everybody is. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't want to work with us, we'll also refer them to Efficiency Vermont. But there's a fair number of people that they just they don't want the help, and they use a lot of electrons. And when they get um, when they get in arrears too large, it's really difficult to dig out. We've had some people from last winter that were using. 1,500 kilowatt hours a month, 2,000 kilowatt hours a month. I know it's electric heat. Um, it's it's difficult to get them out of those kind of bills, but we'll set them up on a budget plan, turn them over to financial assistance organizations, or put them in touch with financial assistance organizations, try to get them to pay off the back stuff, try to work with them going forward on education on what they can do differently. It's those that are welcome to the help, we can make a difference, those that just don't welcome the help. It's it's difficult. You can't disconnect in the winter, so if you're strapped, no. you don't pay your electric bill, right. and yes. you pay your go to you know fill up your gas tank. So that that causes we, a real problem. We start seeing more yeah. of them right about this time of year exactly. because utilities realize that they're about to go into a period where they can't do a disconnect. So, uh, and and we've got a investigation going on we're trying to find out how to deal with it is yeah. that I mean some of the stories are, are very sad and sometimes you know you look at them and you say these people are not doing what they could be doing yeah. and somebody has to be tough parent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the investigation is not a contested case right, yeah, That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to pick up on something that Richard said which is um, we agree that the, the best thing you can do is to help to support the co-op's financial help and we had direct experience with this in a rape case was it 10 years ago 2009 yeah, where we, we year, plan. yeah we came in um, with a 10-year uh, we were pushed by the department actually frankly a 10-year capital improvement plan and in order to support that the Public Service Board then agreed to give us a, t a higher tier, and a tier is our return on investment, basically, uh, retur a rate of return. And that has been incredibly beneficial for VEC. Over the course of that period, you can see in here our reliability has gotten much better. Um, Midway through, pardon me? The orange, the orange, the orange in the middle. So our, we're, oh, we're exceeding our SQRP goals on uh, reliability indices and our member satisfaction, which is another slide in, has gone up as well. The other thing is that our bond rating has improved as a result of the, the better, um, the higher tier. We're A plus rating from Standard & Poor's with a stable outlook. We've been at that for a couple of years. Do you want to speak more about yeah, that? Yeah. 
What, what it's done also is it opened up a lot of opportunities for us to have a very diversified power portfolio. Right in the past when we were um, having financial challenges, it was difficult to get anyone to return our calls. And we're at a p position now where we're a very strongly rated co-op and um, we're able to diversify our power portfolio. So we don't have a lot of eggs in one basket. We are really well diversified and it allows us to um, weather you know, some significant changes. We, we generally hedge pretty heavily going into any rate, rate proceeding. And even when we're not in rates, what we're trying to do is constantly be in the market. So we're not gonna win the lottery, but what we're gonna do is provide very steady, consistent numbers. And I think you can see that from our rates. We mentioned that over the last nine years, our average increase is 0.8%. So we think we've been very successful in that area. Um, and it's an area that, you know, we've had, we've had some public policies that have certainly challenged that. We, we talked a little bit uh, between WEC and us about net metering and how the larger scale projects have had a significant impact on us. And I think, you know, from a public policy standpoint, the uh, perception was um, to do siting maybe based on what would be best aesthetically without considering the grid. And that's what's really hurt the um, VEC, especially in our Shi'i, the Sheffield Highgate export interface. That area represents about three quarters of our substations. So almost every substation in the VEC territory is having issues from renewables being put in the wrong spot. Now, Andrea mentioned about the community solar, how that has played very well with the members. It's very cost effective. We can do it much cheaper than what the members would pay for a, net me a large 500 kW net metering project. We can do it almost in half of what that rate is. But what really helps us is we can stick it in a spot where the grid can handle it. That is a key difference, and it's, an, it's a part that the public policy never considered. And right now we're dealing with some of the consequences of that, where we have a lot of constrained areas. And that also kind of ties back to what Andrew was talking about with the energy efficient utility, and Vicki as well, where if you put more efficiency measures into the Shi'i, it actually makes the problem worse. And I think that's difficult for some people to, to grasp. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily make sense, but what it's doing is renewables are bumping other renewables in that area because there's not enough load. So that's why we're, we're, we're advocating or certainly supporting the, the idea that maybe we can take some of those funds and actually add load into the Shi'i to help this problem as opposed to hurt it. So those are some of the key areas that we've uh, been focused on. One other thing I wanted you to touch on, Mike, uh, you asked about the difference for the co-op. Um, Patty mentioned storms, but we should uh, mention our success yes. with FEMA. I, I have that on my list if we had time. But and just this thing about adding load. I know people sometimes go, "What is you're, the same as wasteful?" No, the point is we're low, we're, we're energy shifting. We're going from carbon producing fuels to cleaner fuels, not just we want to sell more electricity. It just people's limbs, yeah. right, you get that, but not everybody. Adding load means sh load shifting to cleaner fuels, okay. Um, as far as FEMA goes, um, we had one storm back in December of 2013 where uh, the cost of that storm was $6.2 million. The most we've ever earned in any given year is $4 million. So that gives you an idea of you know, a seven-day period, we lost basically the entire amount that we would earn in about a year and a half. And, and what's worked well for us is we're very active with FEMA. Um, you know, we cover 84 towns, eight counties, so you have to actually get every single county approved. Sometimes we get all eight, sometimes we get one. It, it really varies. But if you look back at our history of working with the um, state of Vermont and FEMA, We've actually taken in more than $13 million from FEMA over the years to help us uh, with, with uh, storm expenses. And in this last storm, uh, October of 17, what we did is we applied, we had had some success previously for what we call hazard mitigation. That's actually doing projects that may not be cost effective to do, but they, they will harden ourselves so that when we have a storm come in, we won't incur 
those significant amount of outages. And with FEMA's help, they're sponsoring about 75% of the cost of doing some of these projects. So where it wasn't economic before, it now becomes economic. And we actually got awarded five hazard mitigation uh, projects in this last round of storms. So not only are they helping us out historically, they're also contributing to our ability to handle these events in the future. So that's been a really nice advantage that we have. Mike, can I ask a question about that? Um, these hazard, hazard mitigation projects that you're able to do, are and do any of them involve relocating lines to roads? That's usually what that's usually Yeah, a lot of times, in, uh, the one that we've done um, about three years ago was uh, Gillette Pond in uh, the Richmond, um, Heinsburg area. That had a line that ran along the hill, right? So the hill was shaped like this. The line was up above. And what happened is you can cut your right of way, right, 25 feet on each side, but a lot of our <laughs> lines run through the, the hills, and really 25 feet is, is not nearly enough. Yeah. So with their funding, we were able to take that line, take it out of there, put it underground next to the road. And it's, we haven't had an outage there since, so it, it worked. And FEMA paid about 75% of that one? They did, yes. WEC actually had a similar, we have a similar story, very similar to BECs on that. We got hazard mitigation as well for the October storm. Yes. IOUs don't qualify for this, right. so it is, it is one of our unique advantages. But, you know, we've taken, so when you look at our historical storm costs, for example, when we come in for rate making, purposes. That six million dollar storm is in our, let's say it's in our test year like Patty was talking about. And we've had several of them that have been very expensive. But what we do when we come in, I, I like to say we're, we're on the same side, right? We're both, we don't have the investors that conflict with, with, with our uh, goals. <clears throat> and what we've done is we've taken the FEMA fund in, funding and mitigated that so that when we come in asking for a raise, we essentially are saying, you know, the the, the balance, the risk for us left over, at least historically, was this amount. So we only asked for the difference. We're not asking for the six million uh, from that. So it allows us um, really, I think, a clear advantage. But at the same time, it does give us some additional risk, right? So like Patty was talking about the, the test year and the known and measurable. Well, storms are a very difficult to know what known and measurable is. So our rates do have risk in them because we've taken the FEMA money and brought them down to represent a lower net cost to us. So it is a little riskier, but at the same time, on the positive side, we get help. Huge benefit. Mm -hmm. One other thing that we haven't hit on is what we're doing in the area of storage. And I think you should take that one too since you head up our storage team. So in the storage, storage area, um, we, we, of course, I can't talk specifics because it's right. before you right now. There is, there is. <laughs> but we do, now, we so. do have a one megawatt, uh, four megawatt hour project in our Heinsburg um, area that w we are looking to uh, utilize to help us with some of these grid items. We're also looking at, um, we have a um, relationship with Packetize Energy. I'm not sure if you've heard about them. They're kind of a, a up and coming company and they have water heater controls, and we've had a number of our members sign up for that program, and, and, and we were able to use that during that the, the recent peak event in August. Um, and we also would like to get involved with the uh, residential storage programs. We're working very hard. One of the constraints is that Tesla has minimum order quantities, so when you're GMP, you're able to maybe meet those a little easier than someone like Vermont Electric or, or WEC. So th those do pose some challenges. We really support GMP in having this as a beneficial electrification. We'd like to see that happen. Um, but as far as I'm going to go um, with that, You'll, you'll see that those are public comments, that we are supporting them in having that count as uh, Tier 3. We think it's a very good opportunity to take some of these peaking units off offline when they're um, needed during those times. I think one of the key considerations with batteries is um, that the utility needs to be in charge of where they're placed and when they're called on, if they're going to be used to offset peak and save transmission costs. And I think one of the challenges now is to get a control interface that 
a lot that can be done by automation uh, and that's what we're doing with packetize we're testing out their control I know there are other ones out there but there hasn't been an industry standard set up uh, hit upon that I'm aware of can so you those elaborate on that a little bit when you say placement of batteries are you talking at what scale are you talking are you talking about the megawatt scale storage system, or are you talking about individual residential? I think our biggest concern with residential is really just we don't want to cost shift that. Like, you know, we're worried, like, what we saw maybe with net metering, that maybe some people want that for outage prevention, and that's fine, but we don't want other members paying for that. So, but we're having anybody who wants, like, residential scale, we, we are not worried about that. So, I'm just confused by the word placement. Yeah, we're talking about the larger ones. Larger like one, yeah. Okay. Utility yes. scale. So, we have some um, small commercial applications. MicroStrain is uh, one where we have a uh, battery um, there. Um, but really, what's key with this is if we can put it in places where the grid, and it, and, and it is larger, larger scale. Oh, um, the economics on batteries really aren't that great for the smaller size at this point. We can make the economics work with the larger scale ones. We're still, we're still some years away from the smaller, smaller sized ones. And what we found with the larger ones is there we do better at partnering with somebody because they have access to additional value streams in the form of different markets that they can use the battery in that we just don't play in. So we were happy to do a PPA type arrangement for uh, battery access. So, and Kyle, you correct me if I'm starting to stray, all right? Is that your job? Boy, we have our general That's my job. He, keep, he keeps a, a tight leash on me. Um, are you suggesting that when we look at battery projects, these big ones, that we should be forcing a consideration of alternate sites that focuses on the utility in whose territory the battery is coming, assume it's a merchant, they're showing up, they want to put in a battery, that the utility should be part of the conversation and giving and saying the alternate site where this should go, not because of aesthetics, not because, but because of where our load is, it needs to be over there, not in this town, but in that town. Yes. Is, is, or the is circuit, is more circuit based. The big deal with batteries is they're generators as well as load users. So they can have huge impacts on, on particular circuits. Right. So, you know, it's an area that we're looking at very closely. Citing solar is a challenge, but batteries could be even worse because they can do both. I mean, if they were willy-nilly being proposed by people not um, related to the utility as to where the need is? We wouldn't want them charging at peak periods, for example. That would exacerbate the problem. I think as a practical matter, though, they're motivated to work with utilities because one of the revenue streams is money that we can save uh, in transmission costs by shaving peaks. So stacking those benefits is what makes batteries attractive to developers. I heard one thing that was really impressive to me. The community solar costs the ratepayers at VEC half yeah. of what a commercial uh, 500 kW plant costs. It was 60% with yeah, the So that metering. tells me that your rate design, rate structure for net metering uh, was way too high. Um, there's nothing pending now. And it did not dive deep enough into the actual rate of return to investors in large scale solar, which I believe is in the range of after tax close to 20 percent and you know you, you nicked a little bit of it off but I don't think that change or even a 25 percent reduction from that would significantly reduce the uh, rollout of solar which we support and the uh, what's, it's not the speed program what's it the standard, standard, the standard offer is the best measure of what it's costing to put that stuff in and I, I didn't understand what you did didn't make any sense to me the rates that you set uh, for the goals that we all share but that's I don't you know, you know obviously that was my perspective I just felt like the research that was done in-house about really what it's costing developers to put that stuff in was inadequate oh, let me tell you a puzzle that I have because we've heard the same story we've heard it from GMP hearing it from you guys and that is that 
There's a much cheaper way. Yeah. And the muni's. Yeah, and and the muni's. A much cheaper way to put in solar. So why don't you do it? We are doing it. We have done it. So if 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 you if if you soak up all the it, whether it's the community solar, whatever it is, if you're doing it and your product is half the price of the other product, in a competitive market situation, no there's, one will want to you know buy that. There's no cap, there. though. There's, well, there's yeah. nothing to prevent yeah. someone from putting those yeah. systems. You know what? The yeah. consumers get a better deal with a, a net meter. Ours is a system-wide. Right, but it's co-ops. Your consumers are the same yeah, as Yeah, but they don't as, feel as it as directly as, like, a, a, if a merchant goes to and says, I have a great deal for you for net metering, and you, you know, you can make, save a lot of money, and so if you're just looking at you, yeah, you can get a better deal if you go net metering than with our community solar, but we look at the whole community and say the whole system cost is less, right. but for an individual, there's winners and losers with net metering. Right, okay. And, and for WAC, sorry, see, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I'm a net meter myself, so I, and I manage a group net metering system. But for co-ops, you know, co-ops are located in areas of the state that are um, geographically challenged. We heard about the number of uh, members per mile. And historically, that's one of the reasons why co-ops serve these areas. And so when you have a net metering tariff, which is based on, so, so co-ops essentially have higher rates because they're geographically and historically challenged. And so they have higher rates, and so when a net metering tariff remunerates the DD owner, like myself, based on the cost of the service, the, essentially the rates, the retail rate, it discriminates against the co-op as a whole because there's cost shifting that goes on, and because the compensation is based on an inflated rate for co-ops compared to a uh, compared to let's say the IOU, you're essentially rewarding the co-op PV user at a greater to a greater extent, and therefore the cost shifting which goes on goes on to a greater extent than a co-op. Not because we're co-ops, but because of who we serve. So what I hear from all of you is your view of what we, what the rate should be for net metering is what Richard suggested. Go to the standard offer, which is basically avoided costs. Yeah, let the little ones go in. Let the little ones go in. But when you're putting big ones in that you have to buy? I, and, and really, it's not necessarily avoided cost. It's what the market. I think if you look at avoided cost, that's a different number than what the market will bear. And then standard offer, you do the auction process that mm -hmm. yep. has the market pressure. <clears throat> what, what, one of the things that would be helpful is if that net metering program was 15 kW or less. Because we are very confident that we can get a better deal for our members with systems that have any size to them. And, you know, anything over 15 it's likely not serving a single residential home, unless they got an awful lot of electric <laughs> appliances. Um, really, that's when you start getting into a lot larger, in some cases, commercial accounts, or, or a lot of the, um, those are really hard to administer, is those, those groups. Those, those are challenging. <laughs> <laughs> hey. And we're also hearing from the communities that when we did this recently, just it's getting very complex, the billing oh, from yeah. your end. Yeah. It's um, a nightmare. Yeah. Well, what what disturbs us, too, is that we bring these comments forward, people think we're being anti-renewable, and it's like, no, 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 we support the renewable goals. We just could do it so much you know, more cost effectively. We can get the same renewable product for so a, much less. So much less. And I, I know it's Kyle's hand went up, so we can call the general counsel. Oh, no, no, it's not a caution. I just have a question. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I should know this, but. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what's the range of the fixed costs that you're recovering for, say, a, a 500 kW system? If it's a group residential system, is it just the number of members times $12, would, uh, if it's one town, uh, are you collecting any fixed charge for that, or is everything being net metered? 
So the way that program works now, there's a, bi a non-bypassable portion. So a customer charge still is collected by anybody that's in a group. So if you've got a 500 kW system, and let's say there's 100 um, customers attached to that, they still have to pay their efficiency Vermont charge, they still have to pay the customer charge. So those are non-bypassable, but they can bypass their energy consumption. So at some point during the night, they're using electricity, they're using the grid, and if they're using over the course of a month, more than what they're buying from the 500 kW system, they'll pay a little bit of energy. And what if it's one commercial customer or one school or one town? We one get one customer, customer charge. One customer. And that's what a lot of them are, is the larger accounts. So it's the customer charge mm -hmm. is, is a whole other interesting mm -hmm. issue, which we don't need to get into here, but it certainly does not cover our fixed costs. I wanted to throw one more point out for um, a utility like WEC. We're not only 100% renewable, but we're 100% renewable for the next 20 years. We're long power. So to the extent that we're having to force to purchase and pile on more stuff, it's competing with an underlying portfolio that we've already made investments for on behalf of the utility. So it's as if, so VC's put up a community solar. I don't have a need to put up any more resources because I can't justify that need. So we've already gone out and procured not just solar, but we've procured Coventry Landfill, we've procured Sheffield Wind, we've built a hydro plant. We've done investments on behalf of our members that are already renewable. So anything that we pile on top is just extra cost. And if it's if it's above market, it adds to the rate pressure. I just want to throw that piece out because we're a little bit unique in that space. Can I Offer Rebecca a chance to speak. Do you have anything you want to share with that question? Yes, five minutes. Yes, Rebecca. Well, <laughs> well um, coming from an IOU environment, this has been interesting. So I, it's been great to kind of hear uh, a lot of which I knew and some of which has been helpful to hear. Um, and um, so I think, I think. Um, the, the only thing that I would add that I think hasn't been said yet is just that, not just the ruralness and the, the kind of cost sensitivities of the measures members, but I think also just the pure size of the cooperatives can make it challenging sometimes to um, operate nimbly in, in this kind of fast moving energy environment. And so I think just, um, I'm not sure there's an ask here beyond just I think one of the, you know, when I interviewed and chatted with the board, one of the things I heard is that they want to be innovative and have creative solutions to some of these challenges and it's really hard to do and it's really difficult to kind of pilot and build um, some momentum for those with kind of the limited resources and funding available. So it's just one of the tensions that I see inside the, the co-op model and also just the smaller utility model. Oh, and, and before we close, can you give me, like I asked Weck, how, to, how much does your membership actively participate in your, your activities? We have an annual meeting every year. And what do we get? 250 people out of 30,000 some <laughs> members. <laughs> it's challenging. I agree that when you're raising rates, you have a controversial wind project, people pay okay. attention. In some, you know, I, I know our board of directors would like to have more member engagement. They want us to be out in the community. We schedule events and maybe a couple people show up. So it is a challenge, but it also is, maybe it's a good sign that we don't have an activist membership right now because it means they're not unhappy sure. with their utility <laughs> bill every month. So. We, um, we do an annual member survey. We get a lot of feedback that way. It's really helpful. Um, we, you know, what, very, what percentage? Of uh, your we members it's statistically responded? significant. So we have uh, like 350 residential and about 100 uh, or 150 commercial. So about 500. Do you total. do it electronically or, or in paper or both? Both, both. And um, it's a phone and electronic, oh, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, you know, so that's one way we get a lot, and you know, frankly, these days with social media, we get a lot of feedback in a lot of different ways. Also, we, we get feedback um, through member service uh, cards, you know, if we are, they are doing service, and we get interesting things beyond service sometimes on those cards, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, sure. um, yeah. Um, 
I don't know what else to say about that. What are voting? We, we, we only we get under ten percent of yes. people vote in the elections, and again. To Vicky's point, if we did something that was controversial, we'd get much. Uh, when we built the Casey uh, Community we had a lot Kingdom of Wind project, we had a big. We had a lot meeting. of people show up. <laughs> 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 right, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and for Vermont Yankee, we had some um, some discussions about Vermont Yankee. I, I think Patty mentioned this: is that when folks care about it, they mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> That's when people. And if they choose to be engaged, they're very engaged, like our open rates, so we have an email mark, you know, we have different ways we get information out through our co-op life and, and other things. And we get like 50% open rates on our emails, and that's kind of unheard of mm -hmm. in, the, in the industry. So when we're partnering like with Efficiency Vermont, we'll be like, well, we'll, we'll do an email because people open our emails. Our members actually open our emails. So. so the trick is to figure out how to get people interested in good news. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Newspapers struggle with that. Yes, it's yes. a broad issue yeah. that co ops. Just because I've noticed your interest in the participation issue of democracy, uh, I wanted to point out VEC has a district arrangement for elected directors. How many districts do you have now? For How many do we have? 10? 12. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 seats, course, I guess. Well, they have three times as many members as we do. Uh, we have an at large system, and there's pros and cons to each of those. Uh, but they're, they, uh, more frequently than, than Washington Electric, have contested elections in one or more of their districts. We have a hybrid. We have districts and then we have two at-large zones. Right. Yeah. But although there's still districts, they're east and west. Yes. Yeah. It's, so, uh, and it seems to me that the turnout uh, in those districts is higher than 10% when there's a, a hotly contested election. Right. But I think for, for more for us, I think, than for them, but certainly for both of us, the challenge is uh, trying to recruit or uh, inspire uh, qualified and engaged members who are willing to serve on the board and can make a contribution. Mm -hmm. But that's not just co-ops that have that's that problem. Yeah. Same problem we had in the head of group. Yeah, yeah, so you know the drill. That's right, if you want to get a lot of interest, pick out a very popular employee and fire them in a really offensive <laughs> so I, Or two, don't get any ideas, two, you guys. <laughs> I flatter myself to think that uh, there are at least some members who are just glad that somebody semi-competent is willing to serve on the board and, and dive into all of these issues so that the members can ignore us. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very yes. much. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Well, this we hope you enjoy yeah. hearing each other as well. We so. do meet yeah. from time to time and share ideas. Yes, yep. thank you.